What do you want? <laughs> Hawksmoor, dramatised for radio by Nick Fisher and based on the book by Peter Aykroyd, with Philip Jackson as Nicholas Dyer and Nicholas Hawksmoor. Episode 1. Thus, in 1711, the ninth year of the reign of Queen Anne, an act of Parliament was passed to erect seven new churches in the cities of London and Westminster, which commission was shortly delivered to Her Majesty's Office of Works in Scotland Yard, ever the domain of Sir Christopher Wren. Yeah. The commissioners request an emphasis on steeples and porticos in open sight. They desire that the edifices be monuments as well as places of worship. Yes, 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 of course we undertake it. And I am sensible of the architect to fulfil this brief. And thus I, Nicholas Dyer, was appointed by Sir Chris to effect the design and construction of the aforementioned churches, a task I set about upon the instant, with only my assistant, one Walter Pine, for company. My master is all imbued with fire. A wild passion flares within him while he's about his work. This damps only when he suffers from the gout, which much afflicts him. Employing my most favoured knife, I fashioned the models myself, cutting fine steps from the clean deal, creating, in miniature, exquisite spaces for the great windows, building gradually upon my oaken table a proportionately perfect prototype of the great tower of Christchurch Spitalfields. And as I laboured, I saw with limpid clarity the church rising from the rank earth to tower above the populous conjunction of alleys, courts and slender passageways of this poor parish, where once, long past, had been a field of cows grazing before the plague turned it to a vast mound of corruption to be paved resolutely over with the passing years. And with this vision, I heard the Masons' fierce endeavours ringing like the very chimes of time throughout the parish. What shall you learn, young Thomas Hill? United, father. Follow the line square. Let not the head of the chisel be angled a jot on this. I understand. Though the blow be awful hard, think not to break the stone, rather ease away that which is not required by the express design of Mr. Dyer. We must prize out that which he sees inside. Just so, Thomas. And inside this stone he sees everlasting glory. Now, witness the blow. Was there ever greater sound than stone worked beneath the mason's hand? And was there ever greater sight than plumes of dust rising like thunderheads to softly settle upon a booted foot? The building of a church is a dusty undertaking. A most glorious dusty undertaking. I scarce can wait to see it finish. Well, when we reach that lofty conclusion, you shall have the prize. What prize is that? Come, Thomas, that it is you know the mason's son should lay the last and highest stone at the very top of the tower. Father, I do. So I pray that these days rush by. The design is to be drawn entirely by straight edge and compass. Very well, Master. But do this in lead, not ink, for I do not trust your pen as yet. Oh, vexed, Walter, vexed. I believe I might work in ink. <laughs> then here. See what I risk to keep you merry? You will find your trust is not misplaced. I hope it is not. But, Walter, understand that at the core of our designs lies the art of shadows. You must learn to cast them with due care. Shadows? Why, oh, yes. Only darkness can give form to our work and perspective to our fabric. For there is no light without darkness, no substance without shadow. I build in the day to bring news of the night and of sorrow. But this is by the by. 
You'll oblige me, Walter, to draw the front slow and exact. That which is to last 1,000 years is not to be precipitated. Christopher, and your church at Spitalfields. And what does a green head conclude on such weighty matters? That we've built near a pit where there are so vast a number of corpses. And we do this while Sir Christopher expressly forbids all burials under the church that advance in the rottenness of the structure, and further, as unwholesome for those who worship there. I am aware Sir Chris is all for light and easiness. Then why have we But that is Sir Chris. I am no slave of geometrical beauty. I must erect what is most solemn and awful. From what purse build we these churches? Why, from the imposition on coal. And is not coal the blackest of elements? Does its smoke not hide the very sun in the heavens? Certainly it feeds the fires of the sea. And where is the light and easiness there? Since we take our revenue from the underworld, what signifies it if we also build upon the dead? Master Dyer! Why, Sir Christopher, an unexpected pleasure. Sir Christopher, a seat. Here, please take mine. Here, don't cease flapping ere you take wing, boy. Nick, uh, the Commissioner are expecting your report on the new churches. If it be not done already, get it done upon the instant, since they are in great haste. Haste is for fools and virgins. What? A bauble. Uh, tell me, your church in Spitalfields, it is near complete? It needs only the lead upon the portico. Then buy it now. It is but a mere nine libra the ton. As you recommend, Sir Christopher. And the other churches, are they well advanced? I have fixed on their situations, and three already are being left. I must have exact plans, and press the joiner to build several models. The models are of my own devising, as ever. What you will, Nick, what you will. Oh, and you are invited to a presentation of the music of George Frederick Handel at the Queen's Theatre Haymarket one week tomorrow. Good day. During which brief exchange, Walter cowered in the corner like a baleful pup. Yet I was not altogether indisposed to my lily-livered assistant. Certain things had I impressed upon him. That it was Cain who built the first city. That there is a suppressed science, umbrarum, which the artificer shall comprehend. That architecture aims at eternity and thus must contain the eternal powers, and that all the miseries and barbarities we are under lead the true architect not to harmony or to rational beauty, but to quite another game. I declare I build my churches on this dunghill earth with a full conception of degenerated nature. <laughs> Nick, well met. I thought you might not come. Why so, Sir Christopher? I am unsure of your opinion on Handel. Ah, the Queen's Messiah come to resurrect our nation's musical endeavours. Well, you must admit, we hardly have a composer fit to string an alehouse song together. I do. In truth, I have but the one problem with Herr Handel's music. And what might that be? The environs one is obliged to endure to hear it performed. Oh, what? The Queen's Theatre? Mr. Vanbrugh's own design? Where else would you listen? Of choice, at Christchurch Spitalfields, where the top stone was set today. Ah, went it well? Oh, yes. It went exceeding well. <laughs> Mr. Dyer. A pleasure to have you with us. Mr. Hill, I would not miss this. Not for all the world. Thomas! You are prepared? This is a great day for young Thomas Hill. My son has talked of little but the top stone for weeks. He is nimble of foot. He climbs your scaffold well. <laughs> Nearly there now. You do well, Thomas. But a few steps further. On, boy, on! That's it! It is in place! 
What noise is that? The timber of the scaffold. Look beneath his foot. Thomas! The timbers cracked asunder. The boy missed his footing and tumbled from the tower. Curved lines are more beautiful than straight, I thought, as he fell away from the main fabric. Thomas! The body smote the earth beside the small pyramid I had erected in the gardens of the church. His father rushed to his side, but it was clear to me the boy was already dead. Peace, Mr. Hill. You cannot help him now. He has forever fled this earthly prison. No, no, my son. My only son. Thomas Hill now resides in a better place. Do but give him leave to be buried here. Here where he fell. Yes, it went exceeding well. And you believe Christchurch would form a noble setting for Handel's work? It is an immaculate auditorium. Immaculate? In its volumes and acoustic properties, in its very fabric. Music is ephemera, naught but a quivering of the air, occasioned by the gentle agitation of strings or the projection of human breath. In truth, it is a delicate thing. And? And there is but the one place where such transients should be aptly set, in stone. Ah, we begin. And the beauty of stone you helped teach me, Sir Christopher. Thus am I ever in your debt. How I do veil my intentions with cant. Oh, I will use any scaffold of words to counterfeit my purpose. I have placed a labyrinth beneath Christchurch, as well as the pyramid in the manor of Glastonbury close by. I tell them I fashioned these things as was the custom in the fourth century, the purest time of Christianity. Thus they acquiesce and have no knowledge as to my true design. As for the boy that fell, I confess I could hardly refrain from smiling. Yet with a mighty effort, I hid myself with a woeful countenance. I had the necessary sacrifice, and not at my own hands. I rejoiced exceedingly at that. Oh, I am in the pit, but I am gone so deep that I can see the brightness of the stars at noon. It may surprise you, but I do recognise your voice, you know. It does surprise me, actually. When you're on a case, I'm none too sure you recognise yourself in a mirror. Very good. As it happens, I'm not on a case. Oh, excellent. Then you can buy me a drink. I'm just round the corner at the Red Gate. Oh, I don't know. Oh, come on, Nick. You spend far too much time on your own. Get a life, as they say. All right. Just a quick one, mind. What's the music? Well, I should have guessed. Why? Because the last time I saw you, you were heading for a recital of Handel at Spitalfields, if memory serves. Um, concerto for organ in D minor. How the hell do you remember that? <laughs> it's not only detectives who store useless trivia. <laughs> so, what were you up to when I rang? Aside from listening to Handel. Nothing. Not reading? Ironing? Ironing? <laughs> Sorry. Given the shirt, hardly ironing. You must at least have been thinking. What about? God, I don't know. Queen Anne's London. That's all for today. You should be getting home. Thank you for staying on. Thomas, that was excellent. Excellent! Right, teacher, oh. thank you. Uh, no, I ain't. I just did what she said. That's yeah, all. Yeah, no, no, teacher's little pet. That's uh, you and this. Uh, uh, this is what happens uh, to smiling little pets. Now, uh, tell you. us, uh, are you going to be burned or buried? Uh, uh, eh? Come on, burned or buried, uh, Tom Hill? Buried. 
<laughs> Loud to teach his little pet. Buried up. Thomas Hill uh, is no good. Uh, Chop him uh, up for firewood. Uh, when well, he's dead, uh, boil his uh, head. Boil his head. Boil uh, his head. What's this? A book? Because so bloody clever, uh, eh? Mm. Dr. Faustus and Queen Elizabeth, what a load of bullets. Yeah. The red bass on hinge isn't bollocks. If I say bollocks, it's bollocks. Leave me alone. Oh, yeah. We know teach uh, little pets like to be alone. Yeah. We've seen them hiding at the uh, church behind the pyramids. They uh, been in the tunnel and all. No, I ain't. Then uh, maybe we'd better put uh, you there. Easy to break uh, those bolts. Leads us to the major passages, my uh, dad says. Uh, what goes on for miles uh, down into the earth. Uh, he might get lost and never yeah. come back. Uh, Thomas Hill uh, is no good. Chop him up for firewood. When he's dead, boil his head. Boil his head. Boil his head. Boil his head. Here is the church and there is the steeple. Open the doors and where are the people? Tommy, I'm back. Hello, dear. I've been reading again. Yeah, about little St. Hugh, who was only ten and had no dad. He was lured into an underground killing place where he was tortured to death. They found him a week later and this blind woman touched his body and could see again. Tommy, I don't think that's the sort of thing you ought to be reading. That's a horrible story. Did you have a nice day at school? All right. Mum, you know that pyramid in the churchyard? It gets hot. Why? Look, I've told you, I don't want you hanging around that place. Apart from anything else, it's not good for you to spend so much time on your own. God, got the dust in here. Where's that come from, Mum? Mm, don't know. The ground, I suppose. Walter, I have been thinking on the dead. I'd rather you did not. Mm, dust to dust. And poor Walter is afeard. I've near finished the plan for Sir Christopher. Ah, Sir Chris. Did I ever tell in your hearing the story of Nestor? No, I think not. He was the inventor of mechanic power. Once, he designed an edifice which was so finely contrived that it could bear only its own weight. Thus, would it fall down, Master Pine, with no other pressure than the setting of a wren on top? <laughs> <laughs> I have other news for you that also touches upon Sir Chris. I had them build the sepulchre at Spitalfields a little way off from the church itself. I was sensible of your fears. I don't know Limehouse too well. Ah, interesting part of town. Or rather, that whole chunk of East London is, especially for death. How do you mean? It's wet with murder, both past and present. Almost as if killers are drawn to where mayhem has already occurred. You don't really believe I note it. From Jack the Ripper in that maze of alleys around Spitalfields and the savage killings on the Ratcliffe Highway to my own work at Red Maiden Lane and the treasure trove of gore under the floorboards of Swedenborg Gardens. I don't know how you deal with it. My job to. It's that easy, is it? No. You have to construct some fairly elaborate defences, or you'd go mad. Now, I'd like to offer you another, but I'm afraid I'm due elsewhere. Mm. Handles water music somewhere by the Thames, Limehouse, for instance. I had told Walter something of the sepulchre at Spitalfields. As for the chamber itself, it will be solid only in those parts that bear weight and will be so contrived with inside to form a most intricate labyrinth. I have placed cavities in the thickness of the walls where I will secrete the necessary arcana. If violence does not happen and it remains buried from vulgar eyes, this will endure 1,000 years. Here is the church and here is the steeple. Open the doors and where are the people? <laughs> Why are you following me? What, what, what do you want? S stop staring at me!
Get away. Hide. But we're safe. The, the tunnel. A maze of passages, they said. Yeah, the tunnel. No one will look here. The wood's already been broken. Great. Nice and warm. Safe. You do well, Thomas, but a few steps further. What noise is that? The timber of the scaffold looking beneath his foot. Thomas! Tommy? You home? Tommy? Tommy? Because I'm a child of the earth. He has the sign over him. He is corn thrashed from the chaff. Has anyone seen my Tommy? He's gone missing. Has anyone seen my Tom? Has anyone seen my son? Tommy! My name's Thomas Hill, and I live at 6 Eagle Lane, Spitalfield. <laughs> and I hurt. I hurt all over. <laughs> I've, I've got a bus ticket. It has a number on it. 21549, Valley to Clapton Pond. N not transferable. Retained for inspection. The, the pain's all over me. All over. I hurt. I hurt. <laughs> Please. What? Yes, madam, you have an aisle. He is my son, my only son. He's missing. Please, oh, mind Hush him. now, hush, hush. He won't be coming back, I oh, know. Don't cry, Tommy. Don't cry. And don't mind the smell of the sick. Dad? 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 Have you got your ticket? You'll need it. You've got a long way to go. But... but I, I, I thought you were dead. You're up very late, you know. <laughs> Why? Nat! Nat! Give me air and light a candle. Oh, I was dreaming now of a fearsome dark place. It's a gloomy morning, Master. Terrible raining and cold. What I discovered earlier, a little mouse warming itself within your fender there. A mouse, say? Eh? What did you do? I fed the poor thing some milk. Damn it, Nat. Brain the creature. Do not nurture it. Well, I'm not of your opinion on the subject, sir. Are you ready to rise? No. I remain gouty, most feverish. Shall I bring breakfast? Yeah, the thought turns my stomach like rancid cream. Why are we all must eat, Master? Last night at a boiling cook's, I had two penny worth of beef, one a pudding, and I was like to have... Nat, a leave off this twittle-twattle. Damn it, but the swelling beneath my knee is like to become an insisted tumour ere long. Then let me apply the apothecary's remedy. Oh, not mourn oyster shells boiled in cider and blisters of cantharides upon my neck and feet. I'm damned if I will. I'll suffer my affliction, but I see not why I should endure the cure of it to boot. You say so. I do. Now, look you, Nat. Send message to Walter Pine. Tell him to dispatch to the commissioners the plan of my second church in Limehouse on the scale of ten foot in one inch and fashioned in ink, as far as he is certain on it. <laughs> that should set him trembling like he had the very ague. 
Naturally, made I no mention to my callow servant and would-be rodent wet nurse Nat Elliot of the signs that I would place in my churches, so he that witnesses the fabric may also see the shadow. Thus, in St. Anne's of Limehouse, the nineteen pillars of the aisles will represent the names of Baal Berith, and the seven pillars of the chapel will signify the chapters of his dread covenant. Oh. Neither did I mention Giordano Bruno, where he speaks of the raising of devils. Raising of devils, did you say? Ah, this is best. The fever has been fearful bad. My mind runs badly and knows not what he finds nor blurts. I have paid the ten shillings for my dwelling, have I not? Oh, you have paid, yes. Memory must fly with a fever. You suffer mightily. As it was with my husband of dear remembrance. Oh. Suffering has been my life, Mrs. Best. As a child, the first story ever I learned was of Faustus. And while I did rejoice at his travelling in the air, still I suffered horribly at night on consideration of that singular end the devil had devised for him. Well, we are all haunted by nightmares, Mr. Dyer. Yet mine became real. I was but eleven when the plague was visited upon my parents. You stayed with them? I fled. I could not bear to see them endure the contagion. Yet still, I witnessed their burial. How so? By chance, I saw their corpses on a cart, all entwined with a bundle of carcasses, a ragged and swollen nest of worms. I followed till this dismal traffic ended in Spitalfields, where a vast pit had been dug, and the moist bodies were shoveled into the blackness. Wept, poor boy. No, at that moment did I see the true face of our great and dreadful God, and I could not weep, but I can now build. And in that place of memory will I fashion a labyrinth where the dead can give voice once more. I follow you not, Mr. Dyer. Oh, the, the fever speaks, Mrs. Best. How did you survive? Not all pass by on the other side. What art thou, little creature, that hides in my doorway thus? I am but a poor boy, sir. Why? Have you no name? Uh, Faustus. Ah. Well, if you will come with me, little Faustus, I will save you from ruin here in Blackstep Lane. I will go with you, sir, for I have nothing. Then step inside. It's awful dark, sir. Forward, little Faustus. Have no fear. Why is it so heated here? One day you will comprehend. Wait, we are on the threshold. Mirabilis has returned. I greet the assembly. As we greet thee, Mirabilis. And I bring a child. He has the sign over him, for he is the corn thrashed from the chaff. Little Faustus, drink this cordial to sustain you. Why, thank you, sir. That makes my heart beat fast, sir. It is of no import. Now, look you into this glass and tell Mirabilis who you most desire to see. My mother, sir, before she stank with the contagion. Look close now. Do you spy her as the mist parts? Mother? Mother! But how? I will teach you much that is wondrous. Let me bathe your forehead. It is prickled with sweat. What, what is that, sir? It is that which consecrates the chosen. Is... is it blood, sir? Peace now, peace, and sleep, sleep, 
Thus did I begin my apprenticeship into the prodigious practices of Mirabilis. This was where I first learnt that he who created the world was also the author of death. Many an ancient teaching did I glean that I place now in my churches to bring them into the memory of this and future ages. And here did I become expressly acquainted with the true music of time. What I know now, I would be glad to unknow, but my memory will not allow me to be untaught. Have you seen Mum at all while I've been away? God, no. Why not? We have absolutely nothing to say to each other, and that's why not. Nothing there. Well, there must have been once. Once there was. Bloody great mistake. Oh, thanks. That makes me feel like a million dollars. Anne, there are things we can't alter. That's the way it is, and you can't change it, so don't try. That's a pretty miserable philosophy. If being realistic is being miserable. It's not realistic. It's fatalistic. The subject is closed. God, you can be difficult sometimes, Nick. Tell me about Egypt. Can I have another? Help yourself. Egypt. Egypt was pretty scary, as a matter of fact. The chief god of the Syrians was Baelzebub, the lord of flies. Our druids delivered the same mystery by way of the secret Kabbalah. They held that human life cannot be secured without the sacrifice of that which is pure. When the time of my learning with the assembly was over, Mirabilis told me how my destiny was linked to the ancients. He said I must build and that I should one day turn the mere paperwork of the meeting house in Blackstep Lane into a true and cherishable monument. Let stone be your god, said he, and you will find God in stone. Shortly after, I became prentice to a mason, one Richard Creed. Now, be it by fortune or design, I was in the yard when Sir Chris himself appeared. He was principal architect for rebuilding after the fire, but I knew not, of course, his face. Good day there. Is Mr. Creed upon the premises? Sadly, he needs must be elsewhere. There is new stone, I am promised. We left no detail of business. Well, I trust what he does have for me is a better condition than this mere rag. Well, this is not rag, sir. Look, there are no flint beds or clay holes near the face. Well, well... I know you where the Rygate stone is, for that is what I ordered. Why wish you for Rygate? Well, you may cut it like wood, it takes in water. Good stone should gather a crust and thus defend itself. Now, from Oxfordshire, down the river from the quarries about Burford, comes a better stone entirely. If you would but wait for my master... Uh, what need have I of a master with such apprentice before me? Can you name stones? Brick? Rag? Flint? Freestone? Marcosite? Pebble, slate, tile, whetstone, pumice, emery, alabaster, touchstone. Hold! There is more method here than in Vitruvius himself. I take my method rather more from Master Deedling. Is that so? I do not recall he was translated into English. Ah, uh, oh, I must have taken much from the illustrations. What's say there? Dick Creed, well met. I have here a boy will teach you new tricks. <laughs> Why, Master Dyer is but a simple princess. And Master Bellardio was but a mason and was called Lapicida long before he was ever known as Architetto. So, what of roofs, young Architetto? Oak is best, and next to that, good yellow deal. Dick, I entreat you that he should be released into my charge. Why, uh... <clears throat> why, but of course, Sir Christopher. Sir Christopher? Under Wren's wing... I rose. At first I was a mere servant, but by and by I took much command upon myself. Sir Chris let me go unchecked, as he was so ensnared with the building of St Paul's. One day he became intrigued by reports of the quality of the slabs at Stonehenge. Some of a lightish blue all a glister, as if minerals were set within, others greyish and speckled with emerald green. I persuaded him that we should visit the place ourselves. Well, Nick, you gawp, 
But what say you? This whole place resounds with naught but stone. The sky itself seems made of it. Certain it is. It has proportions all exquisite. Some say Merlin was its father and lifted these slabs by mysteries of magic. <laughs> Some of your thoughts fly wild, Nick. Why, then, here is another. Your hand hmm? rests upon the altar stone. What? It is harder and designed to resist fire. I see no scorch marks. I tell you, this is a place of sacrifice. These slabs are the image of God raised in terror, or men metamorphosed into stone. It is said that old men dream while the young see visions, and you are young still. The Memphitic Pyramid was 20 years and 300,000 men in the building. How many must have labored here, and for how long? We can but conjecture. Know you the base of that pyramid has exact correspondence to the shape of Lincoln's Inn Fields? Hmm? Should we raise a pyramid there, above the fetid streets of London? A pyramid to be... <laughs> huh? Sir Christopher, feel you unwell? Forgive me. I, I just now had a vision of my son. Dead. Months later, news over distance travels slow. We heard that the son of Sir Chris had died of a convulsive fit in a foreign land by the River Nile at just that time. So why was Egypt scary? It was just the atmosphere. I've never encountered anything like it. Come on, Anne, a keeper of Egyptian antiquities, frightened on an excavation. You weren't there, Dad. Lounging in the desert sun? No, indeed I wasn't. I was watching the autopsies on two bodies dragged from the Thames. One blue and bloated with a decomposing gut in the invasions of eels after weeks in the water. The other lovely and fresh and recently in contact with a sharply spinning propeller blade. But Egypt was scary. You better stay in the museum in future. Okay, okay, enough. Scary as murder. Was your life in danger? I really don't know. But I do know this Memphite tomb was totally unlike others I've visited. Why? Partly the signs hidden in the labyrinth. Oh, and just what were these signs? Aside from what I'd expect, hieroglyphs from the Book of the Dead and images of Anubis, there was an incredible leonine figure with red eyes, an image of the beast. I hear the fact that the fire of London occurred in 1666 is highly significant. Oh, Dad, this is tiresome. It's like you were with Mum. You won't take anyone else seriously, will you? Well, were there any other people there spooked? I did discuss it with the archaeologist that started the dig, Professor Mellon Aykroyd, and he certainly thought there were some strange... Oh. <coughs> Hello? I'm sorry to disturb you, sir, but you asked to be told when that database was up and running again. When it is? The IT boys say so. OK, Walter, I'll be in shortly. Bye. Okay, bye. I'm afraid Memphitic Egypt will have to wait. Oh, God, not a new case. I remember this only too well. It'll be like I said. You won't recognize yourself, let alone anyone else. Work continued apace on my church at Limehouse. Yet was I in want of a sacrifice to consecrate it. However, there are many beggars and lost vagabonds in that parish who do acknowledge that the beginning and end of all flesh is but torment and shadow. Cast an eye of pity on a poor decayed tradesman. What was his trade? A printer. In Clerkenwell, perchance? I hail from the West Country, sir. Fell you into debt and were forced to break? Strong water let my affairs slide. How are you caught? Ned. And why came you all this way? I know not. Except it seemed to me I had to. Why look you so fearfully on me? I have a swimming in the head. Last night I dreamed of riding. And he didn't cream. Ned, Ned, you are very much the child. Well, perhaps I have become so. But what end do I have now? Save the gallows. Better it would be to choose your own occasion. <gasps> I cannot commit self-murder. But you cannot fear death. <gasps> for you have endured more pain in life. 
Here. Take my knife. And let us go to the church. Do it here, Ned. You know it is meat. Somehow, I cannot. Here. Let me help you guide the blade. Here, just here, between these mortal ribs. Dear Ned, see how you bleed so sweet. Too angelic. I might have been angelic once. Ow, pass the bollocks. We're all right. <clears throat> Over here. Christ. It's dusty, isn't it? At least it's dry. Where are you from, Ned? <coughs> Bristol. But I've been in London so long, the accents fell off like a cranky wheel. Mm. <laughs> what you do down there, then? Work for this firm, mm. printing stationery. Mm. One day, I just walked away, not carried on walking, all the way to Limehouse. Yeah, you must have seen some things on the road. Yeah. I even saw some spirits at Stonehenge. <laughs> then you've been drinking, Ned. Not a drop. As I looked at the stones, there was voices in the air, and I heard my own father say, I had a vision of my son, dead. <sighs> Next, I dreamed I was climbing a pyramid. I get to the top, look down, and all around me is London. Near the Thames, I see the steeple, and I figure the swamp of the Nile is the Isle of Dogs. And Anne, saint that she is, is guarded by the jackal-head Anubis. While St. George is the Sphinx, crawling on its belly in Bloomsbury and Wapping. <laughs> I never heard such a load of puss and bollocks twittle twattle in all me life. <sighs> this is now what they call the strange time. Bye. More twittle twattle. Your brain's gone, Ned! Time's getting on. Strange time. At my church. Come now! Come now! Come! Yeah, through the dust. Through the dust to the church. My church. I can taste blood. I'm not going to run. I've done running. No light without dark. No stone without dust. In columns suspended. I'm a little giddy. It's time, isn't it? Help me, Shadow. The shadow falls naturally here, since the clouds, though they be nothing but a mist in the air, cast their shade across the surface of the Thames. Learn to do this in stone, Walter. And look you, how the body of the water moves. All things flow, even when they seem to stand still. Walter, what plays upon your mind? Do not trouble yourself. I would know what is the matter. 
Why, nothing. You trouble me now indeed, Walter Pine. It is but a trifle. Do not hope to put me off with such stuff as that. They... They talk of you in the office. What? They say you stuff my head with mildewed fancies and antiquities. And they say... I must follow another if I am to rise. <laughs> you are a fool to believe that any of these voices be your friend. Such as these are mere flies who will feed on excrement and the honey pot with equal zeal. So who are they that speak of me? I would only say they are known to you, sir. Indeed. <laughs> as villains. Why do the living still haunt me when I am gone so deep among the dead? Did you, sir? Amy. Is DS Walter Payne still about, you know? Um, yes, he is quite aware, unless you... Well, if you haven't spot him, tell him I'm on my desk, will you? Relationships. Connections. Ned Robinson, no fixed abode, strangulation. Crypt of St Anne's Limehouse. OK. No fixed abode. 86 matches. I think not. Uh, strangulation. Uh, 40 matches. Um, church. Come on, come on. Uh, Christchurch Spitalfields. Thomas Hill of Six Eagle Lane, age 10. Strangulation. Might be something. Might be nothing. That evening, Following the unexpected revelations about my enemies at the Office of Works, I drank a soothing pot in the Red Gates, an alehouse I was wont to frequent close by the Seven Dials. Upon a sudden, a fellow appeared from the meeting house in Blackstep Lane. Have you not heard of the affair? What affair might that be, Joseph? The mob heard report of our activities. A riot was raised, the meeting house destroyed, and many of the assembly hacked to death. Oh, the mob knows all. Be easy in your mind. Your part is not uncovered, and the remainder of the assembly are still unknown. Oh, good. Then I propose a new design that will bring all back into order and protect us. Speak and I assist. I fear the laborers at St George's in the East may have suspicions against me. I believe I can persuade the Commission to dismiss them on some trumped-up charge, such as the mortar is not so well beat, or they have mixed too vast a quantity of Spanish with the brick, whatever. And then? I hire you and your fellows from the Assembly to build my church at Wapping in their stead. <laughs> and Joseph, know you this. It is my fixed intention to build the Sovereign Temple on Blackstep Lane. What of the sacrifices we must perform? I warrant we will find all we need among the pickpocket boys of the Moorfields. Son, why have you brought me here? Because certain deeds are necessary for the special consecration of this place. There is an older faith than you could ever imagine that decrees this. The building above you demands it. The very stone here about you requires it. I don't need the harm. No. Yet what is sorrow but the nourishment of the world? What is man but unchangeable evil? It is time, Master, time. Pity I cannot, for I am not so weak. But it is not to be believed that he who holds the knife is without his own torment. Blood was all about me at this time, as I was obliged to attend with Sir Chris, one of his frequent forays into the anatomy of the human form. Oh, Sir Chris was ever strolling abroad to seek out fresh wonders, for which his appetite was all insatiable. He had on this occasion been called by the coroner's office after the discovery of a woman who appeared to have taken her life by drowning in the Thames at Southwark Reach. The Romans held it unlawful to look on entrails as we do here. Eh, have you the stomach for this, Nick? It is not my stomach, Sir Christopher. <laughs> Very good, Nick. Now, see here. The valve and the entrance of the gut colon. And here, the milky veins and the lymphatic vessels. 
Uh, so, Sir Christopher, it, uh, it was self-murder. No! First she received a blow to the head. You see the large settlement of blood here. Whereafter she was throttled. This understood from the stagnation under the ears and from the blood on her breast. Here. Uh, good. Very good. Thank you, Sir Christopher. Uh, my pleasure. And if Sir Chris was all agog at the interiors of the human form, he was equally hungry for news of the mind, sane or crazed, and organised a special viewings for us in Bedlam. Would you like some of this, sir? Come now! Come now, come now! This is but a showing room for whores. And what better place for lust than among those whose wits have fled? We live in a mad age. There are many fitter for bedlam than some of these here can find. A curious reflection, Nick. What little purpose have we to glory in our reason when the brain may be so suddenly disordered? Well, that uh, may be, but uh, ha, ha, we are arrived. Now, fear not, the demoniac is fast in chains. Man is this? Peace, watch. Have done. Have done. See, his lips do not move. Have done. The other day, I looked for your worship, the other day, which lies in the quadrant of a magnet in the sector of the twins that go in the shade. So guard yourself from the horse lies. Thus have I puzzled all my scholars over it. <laughs> what? More death still Nick. 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 More death. Why? You are my own! How? Hark you, boy! Hark you! One hawk's more will this day terribly shake you! In no wise could he have known your name. But that was a passing strange coincidence. In truth it was. And who, then, is this Hawksmoor? No man I know. Two deaths. Strangled. An old man of the road. A local boy. Both at churches. Connection or coincidence? Chief Superintendent Hawksmoor. This dunghill earth is sunk deep into night. There is not a field without its spirits, nor a city without its demons. Lunatics speak prophecies while the wise tumble into the pit. We are all in the dark, one with another. Many speak only of what is rational. They are so fixed upon matter, experiment, and secondary causes that they have forgot there is a thing in the world that they cannot see, nor touch, nor measure. It is the precipice from which they will surely fall. Master! Oh. Oh. Nat! Nat, have I, have I slept the night? Why, yes, and the post boys brought you this. Fetch me some beef and eggs. I have an appetite this morning. Beef and eggs, yes, master. I know your work. If I get good service, I am your best friend and my mouth quiet. And thus is my appetite flown. Does someone know of Blackstep Lane? No, no. But people have slandered me to Walter Pine at the Office of Works in Scotland Yard. Who might gain from this? One man only. Jealous Yorick Hayes, the measuring surveyor. Yes, I have it. I shall watch him, track him, and crack him like a crab louse. If you hadn't mentioned the possible connection between the boy at Spitalfields and the tramp at Limehouse, I probably wouldn't have blinked. But blink you did, eh, Walter? It being another church, just a bit, sir. Wapping. St George in the East. Body discovered two hours ago. Any ID? Yeah, from the father. It's another young boy, sir. Daniel D. Lives, lived, 
locally. Cause of death? Sounds like strangulation. They're connected. They've got to be. Come on, Walter. Get me through this bloody traffic. Sir. Time is everything. What is sorrow, little Faustus, my scholar? Why, Mirabilis, my teacher, it is the nourishment of the world. Good. What is man? Unchangeable evil. Yes. And what is the body? The web of ignorance, the bond of corruption. And finally, what is time? Why, time is the deliverance of man, brushed with dust and set in stone. That Satan is god of this world and fit to be worshipped, will I offer certain proof. In episode one of Hawksmoor, Philip Jackson played Nicholas Dyer and Nicholas Hawksmoor with Norman Rodway as Sir Christopher Wren and Richard Johnson as Mirabilis. Miranda Foster played Anne, Ben Crow, Nat Elliott, and Thomas Arnold was Walter Pine and Walter Payne. Richenda Carey was Mrs. Best, Andrew Winkert, Ned Robinson, and Terence Edmund, the demoniac. Helen Ayres was Tom's mother and Claire Corbett, the teacher. The children were Jordan Calvert, Luke Smith and Bradley Souter. Hawksmoor was dramatised by Nick Fisher and based on the book by Peter Aykroyd. The director was Janet Whittaker. Hawksmoor, dramatised for radio by Nick Fisher and based on the book by Peter Aykroyd, with Philip Jackson as Nicholas Dyer and Nicholas Hawksmoor. Episode 2. Morning. I'm Detective Chief Superintendent Hawksmoor. This is Detective Sergeant Walter Payne. Your divisional superintendent has informed you of my involvement. Indeed. Who found the body and when? A tramp looking for somewhere to sleep, 4 a.m. Did he see anything that might be of interest? No. He's sodden, barely articulate. And where is the body exactly? It was just there. But I authorised its removal after his father had identified it. You did what? Well, I know the procedure. Any evidence will be intact. Inspector, firstly, you clearly do not know the procedure. Secondly, I happen to be sir to you. Never touch the body. Never so much as breathe on the bloody thing before the senior officer arrives at the scene of the crime. Got that? Yes, sir. Because that is the procedure. You can go. God. A child was murdered right here, Walter. And what have I got? White lines. They may as well have hosed the place down with anti-bloody septic. So he's actually followed, sir. Remove the body and the atmosphere of the murder simply disappears. Like so much dust on the breeze. Still, we already have a positive ID. Which isn't entirely a bad start, is it? Well, well, you are clad in your it-could-be-worse wind cheater today. Wind cheater, sir? Holding the wintry breath of mortality at bay. I'm a bit more of a bomber jacket type, really. But you get my drift and feel the draft of the Reaper's scythe. Well, 
something of the sort, I imagine. Incredible. A touch of what appears to be as rare as hen's teeth in the Met these days. Imagination. Thank you, sir. All that long winter's day, while elsewhere Queen Anne discoursed music with Herr Handel, did the serpent Yorick Hayes, that green-eyed monster of a measuring surveyor, plague me, Nicholas Dyer, at the Office of Works in Scotland Yard. Certain was I that he was the maggot-headed villain who had sent that venomous letter threatening the exposure of my activities, the revelation of the sacrifices I had initiated for that very singular consecration of my churches. Finally, he returned home, his fat ass jiggling like it were overstuffed with stools. I turned to my faithful assistant. It is the work of Providence, Walter, that most men are not able to foretell their own fate. For there was one in this room who must surely die. We all must die, Master. Yet it is hard to say who is sick and who is well. Excuse me, sir. This is the boy's father, Mr. D. I'm very sorry, Mr. D. He was... He was such a friendly boy. I'm sure he was. They, um... They asked me to bring something of his for the, for the dogs, is oh, it? Oh, thanks. He's a... Oh, sorry. I, I didn't mean to. When did you last see your son, Mr. D? Uh, uh, six o'clock yesterday evening. Did he happen to say... Danny. He was called... Danny. Of course. Did Danny say where he was going? He just said he was popping out, that's all. Face engorged and blue. Showers of petechian eyelids and conjunctivae suggest asphyxia. The tongue protrudes through the teeth. Blood from burst vessels in both ears. No fingertip impressions on the neck. Several scratches, probably from the victim trying to prise off the attacker's hands. No impression of a ligature, no bite marks, no evidence of sexual assault. Incision made from throat to pelvic bone. I am removing the tongue, aorta and esophagus. I, um... Excuse me, sir. Of course, Walter. Bruising behind the voice box and fracture of hyoid bones suggest considerable strength. Definitely asphyxia by strangulation. Ends. Mary, when is more important than how? I need a timetable. Three to four minutes for unconsciousness, four to five for death. That's not what I meant. I'm afraid the timetable you're after is very tricky. Why is that? As you know, temperature rises sharply during asphyxiation and after death heat loss is variable. So? So, even if I allow for a rise of six degrees at death and a loss rate of only two degrees an hour, then he was killed six hours ago. However, the, the lividity of the bruising indicates that occurred at least 48 hours ago. I, I don't understand that at all. I also don't understand why there are no impressions of the strangler's fingers. I, I should wash. We'll get there, given time. What o'clock is it? Almost six, Mrs. Best. Oh, so quickly by. Oh, I wish I were able to recover it a little. And that in more ways than one. Time cannot be restored, unless it be in the imagination. Hand up! Hand up! Hand! Someone call that horn a bedroom! I would have no need of memories if only that which were present were more agreeable. <laughs> well, Mrs. Best, they do say these old houses have as many ghostly tenants as a mausoleum. So you should not starve for want of chit-chat. It is not words, but deeds I require. I do not have a scrap of nun's flesh about me, Mr. Dyer. Leave me, Master. Nat, in the nick of time. Nat, tell Mr. Dyer about the gentleman, do. Which gentleman might that be? He left no name, no message, neither. Look at the dust on this rail. Cleaned only this morning, too. A pox on it. Who could this caller be? No one other than Yorick Hayes. The poisonous serpent had come to the door of my lodging at an hour when he knew I could not be within, merely so he might confound and perplex me. Yes, it must have been Hayes. 
Why, who else could it be that was seeking to detect and uncover me? Ah, oh, Mr. Hawksmoor. Good evening, nurse. How is he? Much the same. He's missed you, you know. He really has. Go straight through. Thanks. Come, John, come, John, come. Hello, Dad. I've come to see how you're doing. Please yourself. You've always done that, of course. So how are you keeping? I keep myself to myself. Are you eating well? How would I know? You look healthy enough. Well, I haven't got worms. Nick, is there still more to come? What do you mean, Dad? What happened to that letter? Did they find you out? What letter? Is this something you wrote? No, no. Walter wrote it. Walter? Dad, did you say Walter? Here, come to candle. Oh, my God. That's disgusting. I'm going. Yes, here I am, Mrs. West. Well, I've just been having the most interesting chat. Oh, really? About computers, making this world a better place. That's nice. Yes. Who did you have this chat with, Mrs. West? Well, your Walter. Walter's been here. Well, he's still here. I took the liberty of letting him into your flat with a pass key. I was sure he wouldn't mind. Oh, look at the dust on this rail. Cleaned up this morning, too. There you go. Thanks. Okay. Fire away. All the results are in. The only blood and tissue groups were from the victim. No prints or marks of any kind from the killer? Nothing at all, sir. Strike you as odd? Very. Okay. First, young Thomas Hill is found in the abandoned tunnel by Christchurch Spitalfields. Death by strangulation. Though there were no finger indentations. He also had broken ribs and internal injuries consistent with a fall from at least 30 feet. Thorough forensic examination reveals no trace of the killer. Agreed? Agreed. Then, a vagrant, Ned Robinson, is found by the crypt of St Anne's Limehouse. Again, apparent death by strangulation despite a lack of indentation marks. And again, no trace of the killer. Now, we have Daniel D at St George in the East in Wapping with a similar, how shall we say, absence of the killer's presence. And some totally impossible timing, sir. Except the impossible doesn't exist. We live in the shadow of great events. If only we knew what they were. Just where do we start, sir? The beginning. Though I admit that's a bit tricky here. However, murderers don't disappear. Their crimes are not unsolvable. Think of it like a story. Even if we haven't understood the beginning, we must read on, just to see what happens next. We've lost him, haven't we? He'll do it again. They always do it again. But isn't that what we want to prevent? In an ideal world. Of course, I may not have to find him. He may find me. The hawkside creature had been in and out my office without cease. It was clear in abundance how Yorick Hayes spied upon me. And I received another letter that read thus. This is to let you know that you should be spoken about. Flee the office by Monday next or you may expect the worst. I decided then and there, Hayes was a dead man, a jack pudding waiting to be eaten. So I have this right, Master. Your church of St Mary Warmness is to show the ceiling plain without panels and to have the steps of the cupola fashioned of Portland stone. Yes. And there is to be no pinnacle, Walter. Why? There is no necessity for a pinnacle. Why well, have what there be no need of? Oh, very good, Master. Know you the vicar has written again. He says he would have the heathen rubbish that was found on the site removed. Right, that he need not fear the contagion of these fine old altars we unearthed. 
Tell him we are building above as fine a piece of Christianity as he is ever like to see. They may not sing my praise now, but they will never forget my work. Oh, and Sir Christopher sent word. He visits the Commission tomorrow and would be thoroughly acquainted with your latest plans. Shall I inform Mr Hayes to have them taken over? By no means. I will take the plans in person. Thus I called upon Sir Chris at Crane Court, where he had gone to pontificate a lecture for the fine fellows of the Royal Society, who were wont to dissect the mites in cheese and discourse upon atoms and other wild nonsense. They are such quacks as I would gladly piss upon. Were they worthy of my effort? The little turret is a noble piece of work, Nick. The cornices are of stucco. That is my purpose. And the steps? Eight. A 14-inch tread and a 5-inch rise. Then that is resolved upon. Your drafts are well made, Nick. And this work would stand trial in a hurricane. <laughs> How we would have an old and rotten church had it not been for the fire... That were a great blessing. A blessing? What of those who say 1666 contains the very number of the beast, and thus boded some direful matter? Nick, I deem it a disgrace to the reason of mankind to assign the causes of fires or plagues to the sins of men or the judgment of God. We have reached an enlightened age in which we may scatter such mists of superstition. But mankind walks ever in a mist. For this reason you glorify is a chameleon that changes its shape in every individual. Now this is but wild talk. I say this may be the age of systems, but you will fashion no plan to satisfy the truths of those who have looked into the abyss and seen demons. Spirits, Nick, do not exist. But what of the demoniac we saw in Bedlam who spoke so truly unto me? Hush! Mortis! Still Nick! 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 Mortis! Why? You are my own! How? Hark you, boy! Hark you! One hawk's more will he stay terribly shaken! <laughs> In what wise do you mean he spoke so true? I... I mean, clear it is he raved when he spoke of death. I meant only that he knew my name. Coincidence, no more. Why, what dark passions may overshadow the man whose senses are so full of the many productions as you are? My passions are no different from the hypotheses built here. What do we see with the aid of your microscopical glasses but frightful shapes and figures? Breath condensed beneath them shows snakes and dragons within. No mathematical beauty, nothing but the contagion of this dunghill earth. This is but a maze of words in which you will lose yourself. There is no truth so far elevated that man's reason may not reach it. But when reason bids us good night, what then? Why should you ask me such a question? We are on an icy slope and all slide toward the same pit. I tell you, there is a hell, just as there are gods and demons and prodigies. Your reason is but a toy when set against such terrors. You have many unseasonable passions, Nick. Yet the years we have been acquainted cannot be obliterated by your melancholy temperament. I admit I am of a melancholic humour, but it has been aggravated by many hardships of which you know nothing. I know now, Nick. Had I said too much? Had I said all? Yet I bethought myself of Vitruvius. O oh, pygmy man, how transient compared to stone. When my name is no more than dust, and my passions are cooled forever, when even this age itself is for succeeding generations nothing but a dream, my churches will live on, darker and more solid than the approaching night. That evening, I plied Yorick Hayes, that miserable specimen of a measuring surveyor with strong liquor, led the traitor to St. Mary Woolnoth, and throttled him happily to death in its shadow. Yes. Good morning, sir. Looks
Looks like our man's killed again. What? Where? By St. Mary Warnoff Church near the Bank of England. It's another young boy. <sighs> At last, we have an opening, Walter. A chance of finding connections and signs. Signs, sir? Of the killer. Fibers, hair, blood, saliva, skin. You'll be leading the forensic team yourself? Certainly I will. Morning, sir. Morning. Entirely untouched. Exactly as you requested. Good. Ah. Uh, the eyes are still bright. The muscles haven't relaxed to the vacancy of death quite yet. So... What was the last thing you saw before the blinds of consciousness fell? The killer. Right here. <laughs> I can practically smell him, Walter. Ah, founded in the Saxon Age and last rebuilt by Nicholas Dyer, 1714. Well, well. Dust to dust. You believe in ghosts, sir? Spirits, Walter, do not exist. Now... Uh, tape indicates nothing on the neck, but bag this all the same. Of course, sir. Have you noted the weather conditions? Light drizzle, yes, no, sir. No, I need the precise temperature. How the body cools is crucial. Morning. Ah, morning, Mary. You want a thermometer beside the liver, don't you? Absolutely. Just as well I happen to have a sharp knife, then. You know what I need. Time, your favourite subject. You're wondering if it's the same killer. I'm sure. It's an identical modus opera. operandi. You're right, sir. Walter, come on. What is it, sir? There's someone in the shadows under the scaffolding. Where have they gone? Only way to be down where they're excavating. Let's take a look, shall we? You don't think? I don't know what I think. Keep your wits about you. Looks like the foundation's got pretty deep. Sir, there's someone there, behind that sheeting. Right, back me up now, Walter. I'm on your shoulder, sir. Don't move, please. Oh, how interesting. Who are you? What are you doing here? The name's Penny Emery, archaeologist. Why? Check that, Walter. Sir. There's one plane here. Uncovered anything of interest, Miss Emery? Well, flint blocks, masonry, foundation trench. How far down have you reached? Well, so far, we've got to the 6th century. That old? Oh, there's always been a church here. I think Dyer liked to build on the dead. I'm sure there's lots still to discover. Maybe more bones. Bones? Hmm. We found a skeleton higher up. Two, maybe 300 years old. I wondered if it might have been a workman killed while the church was being rebuilt. Oh, that's certainly a theory. My daughter's an archaeologist. Oh. A keeper of Egyptian antiquities at the British Museum. Loves digging into the past herself. The story's confirmed, sir. And we have idea on the dead boy. His name is Matthew Hayes. Reported missing last night. John Vanbrugh it was who brought word of Hayes' demise to the Office of Works. Further, he informed me it was Walter Pine that discovered the body. Indeed, I had not seen Walter all that day, which had perplexed me greatly. Later, I found written upon a little paper tucked beneath a box on Walter's desk these words. O oh, misery, them shall die. I puzzled long till I anagrammatized the letters, and to my horror discovered they also read thus. Dyer has smote me ill, with YH for the name Yorick Hayes. Tremendous. Perfect setting. St George's. Stone. Handle bounces off it as if they were conceived together. I'd like you to relax when you're on a case, Dad. Music's not just relaxing. It's got mathematically precise structures, Anne. Every note's a clue to the composition's effect. Surface traces on the stave point to the underlying impact of the whole. Then in concert, a mystery is made transparent. And how's your own mystery? Unusual. People often say the more unusual the case, the easier it is to solve. But not you, and not this one. No. Nope. But reason and observation will prevail. You know, some women say all men are potential rapists. Yeah? Do you believe everyone's a potential killer? Why not? And you know, there's one constant in all murderers. 
They recall the sequence of events around the killing, exactly what they did before and after. But they never remember the moment of death. And that's why they leave a clue. So your killer's left one? Not yet, but he will. Aren't there crimes that simply can't be solved? I don't think so. Maybe this will be the first. Alas, poor Yorick Hayes. No man was more astonished than I at his sad demise, Sir Christopher. Strangled like a bear upon a leaf. I have rosemary to throw upon the coffin. Oh, Here. I am obliged to you, Nick. At least his resting place is meat. How so? He greatly admired St. Mary Walnuth. Mm. To be buried thus in its shadow would surely please him. Well, that may be so. Dust to dust. At your devotions, Nick? I have faith in the true religion. Uh, John Vanborough beckons me to the playhouse tonight. Would you care to join us? And your reflections upon the play? I have quite forgotten, Mr. Vanborough. Save that the sun was a shining disc and thunder was noise from a drum. These are but our devices, Mr. Dyer. But the sun is a vast and glorious body and thunder the most terrible phenomenon. They are not to be mocked, as sure as religion itself is not. <laughs> oh, amen to that, Mr. <laughs> Dyer. Yet the play was well received, was it not? But the audience had so humble an opinion of itself that it thought what pleased the people of fashion ought to please it also. <laughs> found you not that the language was enriched with beautiful conceptions? I found the dialogue fitted up with too much facility. When words should be plucked from obscurity and nourished with care, mm. improved with art and corrected with application. But the greatest art is to speak agreeably about the smallest things, to spread a general evenness of humour and a natural decency of style. No, no. Were I a writer, I would thicken the water of my discourse so that it was no longer easy or familiar. I would employ a huge and luscious style with outlandish phrases and fantastical terms, thus to restore terror, reverence and desire. <laughs> well, John, you and your fellows of the playhouse might have competition if ever Nick decides to leave off fashioning stone for the glory of God. <laughs> More brandy here, boy. The best authors, Mr. Vanbra, are like the best buildings, the most ancient. The fables and religions of the ancient world are well nigh consumed. It is high time to dismiss them, Mr. Dyer. What? <laughs> when there is scarcely any art or faculty wherein we do not come short of the ancients. We live off the past. It is in our words and our very syllables. It is reverberant in our streets and courts, so we can scarce step forward without being reminded of those who walked there before. The past ages eclipse our timepieces, and in those shadows the generations jostle as one. It is the dark of time from which we come, and to which we will return. Not much joy! Cabs, like criminals. Never there when you want them. Let's cross back to Bloomsbury Way. I never know. What? I never know where anything comes from. What are you talking about? Where you come from, where I come from, where all this comes from. Look at it. This vast, bleeding body of a city. Where did it come from? I've said too much. I've said all. Like all life, it came from the sea, didn't it? Fifty million years ago, the site of this capital was covered by great waters. Well, maybe, but I don't see what bearing that has on anything. You get a bearing from a compass app, and a compass is needed here. A compass across time. You see, London clambered from the swamp, constructing itself with the very clay it was based on. They found crocodiles in some of that clay, you know, in Islington, not far from you. Spare a coin for the picture. Very nice. What's he looking at? The top stone of the spire. Where else? What's he holding to his eye? A looking glass. The better to see the full. It's powerful. Here. Oh. The Lord deliver you from this muck rake. Peculiar piece of pavement art. You know, all the changes to the city. Clay to mud to straw to cobblestone to pavement. I like the expanding surface of a balloon. Every part grows at the same rate. 
Yet it all becomes ever more fragile, on the point of implosion and confusion. Dad, what are you on about? Taxi? Well, we've caught a cab, if not yet a criminal. Good night. Good night. The ancients wrote of universal passions, while now people desire only that which is deemed new or surprising. Our predecessors understood nature is a dark room. That is why their tragedies will stand when our very playhouses are crumbled into dust. For they reflect corruption, and men are the same now as they have ever been. I say your reverence for the ancients is an excuse for plagiarism. That is not so. Why, Homer himself built upon many predecessors. It is only from imitation. Plagiarism, Only say I. from imitation do we arrive at order and massiveness. Pray speak that you may be understood, Mr. Dyer. Language was designed for you. You would have me speak plain when my words would blast you. Oh, peace, Nick. John means no hurt. More brandy. Look you, Mr. Vanbrugh. Milton copied Spencer as Spencer copied his master, Chaucer. This world is a continued allegory and a dark conceit. And what is your allegory, sir? I build in hieroglyph and shadow. Oh. And how do your churches with that? They do very well. You build in Greenwich? First St. George's in Bloomsbury, then in Greenwich. Morning, sir. Morning, Walter. What have you got for me? Uh, the usual. Cranks and weirdos writing in with advice. And something unusual? Well, something distinctly weird, sir. Uh, it reads, Don't forget, this is to let you know what I will be spoken about. Oh, misery, if they will die. With this picture of an arrow, I think it is. Well, I can't see them. Wait. Crosses. At the points of the arrowhead and the base of the shaft. This is geography, Walter. Geography. For crosses, read churches. At the apex of the triangle, spitalfields. At the ends of the baseline, St George in the east and St Anne's Limehouse, which leaves St Mary Walnoth further west. Here. Crosses, where our four victims were found. Well, I suppose that's a theory. Oh. And this came with it, sir. One picture, labelled the Universal Architect. Well, well. What is it, sir? I've seen this before. Chalked on the pavement by St George's in Bloomsbury. The artwork of a tramp. So the same person could have done both? Indeed. And a tramp was the second victim. Could that be the church? And, and there be the steeple, open the door, but where be the people? Ah, how do you do, my little one? Who, who are you, sir? Fear me not. You like my Bloomsbury Church of St George? Uh, uh, I like it well enough, sir. That is me, as you will see it for eternity. Master Dyer! Are you with the living today? Ah, Sir Christopher, forgive me. I was lost in a reverie of some delight. Not on events at St George's, then. A young boy was murdered in the shade of your church, but last night, Nick. Then we may hope he exists in a better place now. Amen to that. Where is Walter Pine these days? I am informed he has grown heavy with hypochondrical melancholy. Oh. I visit his dwellings afternoon for enlightenment upon the matter. Let us trust it is but a passing fever. Nick, in your cups with John Vanbrugh, you talked somewhat wildly of the ancients. It was the brandy that preached. I should abjure. Perhaps. Yet it put me in mind of something we shared many years past. Our trip to Stonehenge. These slabs are the image of God raised in terror. 
or men metamorphosed into stone. It is said that old men dream while the young see visions, and you are young still. The Memphitic Pyramid was 20 years and 300,000 men in the building. How many must have labored here, and for how long? We can but conjecture. <laughs> huh? Huh? Sir Christopher, feel you unwell? Forgive me, I... I... Just now had a vision of my son, dead. And he died at that time in some foreign land, did he not? Beside the Nile. A passing strange coincidence, Nick. But this is idle chat. I admire your plans for St. Alphages in Greenwich. You do great work. I do not underestimate your powers. Uh, no! No, begone! Walter Pine, do you not know me? Yes, I know you too well. Oh, I thought you might leave your post and forget me. I can never cancel my obligation to you for your labours. Why, you are my right hand. No, no. I wished you to leave. So you're not the lines I wrote? Some musty <laughs> stuff in anagram. Oh, misery, them shall die. I did. I wrote no anagram. I speak of the letters. What? I wish to entice you to leave the office. Those letters were the work of Yorick Hayes. No, Master. That was my hand, not his. And I'll tell you a mystery. I dreamed I killed Hayes. The next day I found his corpse. I fear the shadows that grow around my mind. What must I do? <laughs> my own assistant had plotted against me. Not the green-eyed monster Hayes at all. Later... I would have to deal with Walter Pine. In the meantime, I made the necessary sacrifice at my newest church in Greenwich, and then turned my fullest attention to the proposal for the church of Little St. Hugh, to be built upon the site of the Assembly of Mirabilis in Blackstep Lane. Thus will I yet complete the figure. Spitalfields, Limehouse and Wapping shape the triangle, St. Mary Walnut and Bloomsbury then create the major pentacle star. All these with Greenwich form the sextuple abode of Baal Berith, Lord of the Covenant. Then, with little St. Hugh, rises the septilateral figure about Blackstep Lane. Let those with understanding count the number. The seven churches are built in conjunction with the seven planets of the lower orbs, the seven circles of the heavens, the stars of Ursa Minor, and the Pleiades. Thus have I built an everlasting order, which I may run through unmolested. No one can catch me now. Where did you find these two? One in Greenwich, the other near St George's in Bloomsbury. Ow. Sorry, there's some tissues over there. Oh, thanks. I pass St George's every day on the bus. Old spot for a murder. Why? Very public. On the bus route, not around the back. I suppose not. Well, there we are. Not a great incision, but never mind. So what can you tell me? Both killed by a ligature that hadn't been tied. Or at least there's no evidence of a knot on the throats. I'd guess it was some kind of folded cloth, but I can't detect any weave or pattern to help you further. Also, there are no prints, marks or stains relating to the attacker. How can he leave absolutely no trace, Mary? I have no idea. But I do hope you catch this bastard. I saw a church tower 12 yards deep. I saw dust made of men's tears that weep. I saw stone all in a flame of fire. I saw a stairway big as the moon and higher. I saw the sun red even at midnight. I saw the man who saw this dreadful sight. So where do we go from here, sir? Where do we ever go? It may look like we're moving. But we're standing still as stone. Sorry, sir? I want the tramp I saw who did the picture. 
He had long hair, matted like tobacco. Tobacco? Mm. Oh, and uh, someone delivered a book through my letterbox this morning. Here. The Universal Architect. This is the same picture. Exactly. The power in images. The seven wounds. Oh, misery, they shall die. Shall I send this for analysis, sir? I've already done that. It's spotless. Walter, track down the nearest DOS house to St George's Bloomsbury. <coughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. We're police officers. Oh, oh yeah. Here comes a candle. <laughs> Does anyone here know someone called the architect? The architect? Well, God bless us all. Do you know him? What if Lud does? I need to discover his name, Lud. Easy. His name is Legion. Where can I find him? <laughs> you don't find the architect. He finds you. When did you see him last? Mummy's brains are removed through the nose. Walter, assist the gentleman to his feet. He wishes to come and help us with our inquiries. Come on in. <laughs> How are you feeling, lad? Well, all perils, especially malignant, are recurrent. Got a cigarette? You were telling me about the architect. Was I? Indeed you were, lad. Well, then I suppose I was. Would I be right to say you know him? You might be. Can you tell me his real name? Anubis. Who knows? But you did see him. When? That's what I'm asking you. When did you see him, lad? That night. What night? That one. All right. What time was it? The time of Glastonbury and Limehouse. Was it very dark? Blacker than the underworld where Seth reigns. Please try and remember what you saw. The problem is, I wouldn't say I was 100% sober at the unvarnished grain of a parallel universe. But next thing, there was the policing. In where? I've seen you before, haven't I? In where? In that church. The staircase rising from the forge. Oh, this is just coincidence, isn't it? Connections. Threaded through Cleo's knee. What does he look like, this man? He's got hair. Like tobacco. And he draws. He draws the life out of you. I've never seen such drawings. I'd say that's the same man. I'd say it could be. Call a press conference. There's precious little to go on. So. It's time. We were seen to be taking some action. We'll let them know there's a certain vagrant we need to interview in relation to the murders. And we can furnish them with a description. I think there'll be quite a few that fit it, sir. Nick! Nick, has news of water been cried up to you? No. What is the matter? I fear he is dead. Oh, I was aware of the illness that beset him. It was him. not of natural causes. He hanged himself. Walter committed self-murder? Can you make sense from that? No, not. But, but wait. In his fever, he told me he had killed Yorick Hayes. You may imagine I did not believe him, but in the light of this... Why then, perhaps he spoke true. Thus did I kill two birds. The death of Hayes was laid to Walter, so putting me out of road of eager inquirers. And Walter had dispatched himself, thus relieving me of the labor. But still was I never at ease. I had each night most frightful dreams. What? What is that, sir? It is that which consecrates the Chosen. Is... is it blood, sir? You will make the necessary sacrifices yourself, in time, when you build your great churches. That Satan is God of this world and fit to be worshipped, will I offer you certain proof? Is this 
The strange time? Strange time, Dad? Do you mean the waiting? I suppose I do. And the smell of death. I heard on the news that you had thousands of sightings and that people were taking the law into their own hands, attacking tramps. Terrible. When murderers kill themselves, they try to make it look like another murder. Crafty to the end. What's amazing, though, is just how many are struck by lightning before they can get that far. What? I often wonder if this whole city isn't involved in the murders committed in its bowels. You see, all that really changes is the form. Strangling and stabbing, popular in the 18th century, while the 19th was all slashed throats and clubbings at the start, and poisonings and mutilation by the end. And death groups across time. There's an ancient murder zone in Islington, right where you are. Yes, there's much more than Joe Orton's blood on your very doorstep. God, Dad, when you're on a case... What? What? This is what Mum couldn't stand. You asked to see me. I didn't ask to see you. If you don't like it, you can leave me alone, you know. I'm not a baby. Why don't you just go? I'm going to, as it happens. That's why I wanted to see you. You might remember I mentioned Professor Ackroyd, if you actually focus on real life at all these days. Oh, the archaeologist, head lost in the sands of time. He's coming over from Egypt. You're not going back out to that spooky old tomb? No. Professor Ackroyd's looking at some strange connections. He wants to go to Stonehenge. A colleague of mine from the museum, Dr Sinclair, is the expert on that, so the three of us are going down there together. And I have to say, that'll be a whole lot nicer than staying here with you. Walter, you got something? Sweet F.A. Oh, well. Have I shown you this? Book? Yes, sir, every day. Really? Oh, well. Did you know there are people who are so frightened of being murdered that they die of their own fear? Imagine. Sir, I... I was wondering... Yes, Walter, come on, spit it out. This wondering. Should you have a bit of a rest? Who told you to say that? No one. It's just that it's been a long time. You deserve a break. And it seems to me that we're not getting anywhere, sir. That's how it seems, does it? We don't have the facts we need. Tell me, do any two people ever see the same thing, in your opinion? Well, no, probably not. It's our job to interpret the facts. And facts don't mean much until that's been achieved. <laughs> well... I suppose. And where does that interpretation come from? Us. And who are we? Don't you think I worry when everything falls apart in my hands? But it's not the facts I worry about. It's me. This morning, I saw before me an image of my own apparition. Every detail of my face as in a looking glass. It wore a strange habit, cut like an undergarment and had no wig. How oh, my nightgown was dark with sweat. I do not fear dying for the agonies of it, being persuaded that I have endured as great pains in this life as ever I should find in death. Yet it may be that I cannot die. Oh, master. Nat, I have this morning vomited up a thing most foul. More fevers and gouty sickness, is it? Shall I bring you water to wash your mouth? Peace, Nat. Can you not see? I have some thing with me. Look! Good God, no! No, spare me! Let me not see nothing! See nothing! I am ready. Ready for my approaching change. Nick, I've been going through the paperwork on these murders. There seems to be precious little progress. We'll get there, given time. Yeah, but we're not becoming any wiser. We're not accruing knowledge. Um, I've, got, I've got something else for you. Not quite your usual line, but... Uh, You're taking me off the case. Well, not so much. That is putting you on another. You're taking me off the case. You've got things out of perspective, Nick. You've done a good job. You've laid the foundations. Now I need someone else to build the case up. Stone by stone. But the bodies are in the foundations. Nick! People have spoken to me. I know you've been under a lot of strain. Who's spoken to you? Who? Before you begin the new case, I think you should take some time off. You knew. Everybody did, sir. It was just a matter of time. You spoke to the assistant commissioner about me, didn't you, Walter? A lot of people were consulted. Well, 
Doesn't much matter now. It's over. Don't bounce back, sir. Dust doesn't bounce. Sorry, sir. Time's a strange master. It passes, and yet... The shadows around us do appear to change, don't they, Walter? In my fever, I am cut down, out of time. I call out for Nat, but Nat Elliot is gone. I will see him no more. I put on my coat, and I leave my dwelling. As I walk, I see prentices playing, laborers about their work, mountebanks calling, cooks dripping at their doors, nuts and oysters and chestnuts piled high. And all these things shall crumple into dust, yet will my churches survive. The city is but a dream blurred about me. St. Mary Axe and London Wall. My tears fall upon the moss. Moorfields, Blackstep Lane, and the vastness of stone of my church of Little St. Hugh. From my first years, thy horrors have I endured with a troubled mind. I look up till I can look no more. I have run to the end of my time. I kneel before the light, and my shadow stretches across the world. Well, how could I be mad yet? You cried out. Something about a troubled mind. Did I, Mrs. West? I must have dropped off. How's the temperature? Still high. Oh. Someone called for you last night. A man. A tall man. I told him you were out. I thought it best. Yes, very good. I don't want callers. That's what I thought. Uh, Mrs. West, I'll be going away shortly. Really? I deserve a rest. So if anyone comes, just tell them. Of course. Where will you be going? I don't know. Where does anyone ever go? What wind blew you hither? What wind blew you hither? I saw a door which opened on a fire. I saw a pit which rose even higher. I saw a child who danced round and round. I saw a house which stood beneath the ground. I saw a man who is not, nor ever could he be. Hold up your hand and look, for you are he. Almost over. No matter. How dark the future. How distant our ancestors. But each age has got the same. And they turned to God. Thinking if there are shadows, there must also be light. Beyond our years, there is an eternity which intersects with time. Here, in this Christ Church, Spitalfields, Nicholas Dyer, 1713. St. Mary Woolnoth, founded in the Saxon Age, rebuilt by Dyer, 1714. Dyer, the connection, the stay for my notes. I'm on the threshold! Sir, please be calm. Dyer, Nicholas, pupil of Wren. Office of Works at Scotland Yard. Commission for New London Churches. Realised seven. Christ Church, George's, Georgian East, and Salphages, Mary Walnut, and finest of all, Little St. Hugh. The last note that completes the work. I've been to all the others. This is the threshold. In concert! Hot oh, chestnuts! Oh, chestnuts. Uh, excuse me. I seek the church of Little St. Hugh. Up St. Mary X, full of London wall. Moorfield, you want black step line? Mind the moss, it can be slipping with tears. Up oh, chestnuts. Up oh, chestnuts.
I have endured all these troubles for my sake. Why have you come here? Why have you come here? He has the sign over here. For he is the corn crashed from the chaff. Oh, the eternal vastness of stone and the transience of man. Where there is shape, there is reflection. Where there is light, there is shadow. Where there is sound, there are echoes. And who, who will say where one is ended and the other begins? Well, Professor, the Great Circle. Stone hinge. The very image of God raised in terror. Or man metamorphosed into stone. Now, if I've got it right, you're looking to connect this to the Glastonbury Pyramid, mm -hmm. to our Egyptian dig and to St. Hans in Lyme... Mm. Oh! Hey, Dr. Oh. Hawksmoor, what is it? Forgive me. I... I... Just now I had a vision of my father. Dead. Feet dance and dance in the dust as I step on smooth and ancient stone. Certain must it be that I sleep, for all these figures now greet me as the inhabitants of a dream. I walk the circle and enter the labyrinth of the pyramid. Yet though I am there, Still am I here, within the sceptre-lateral figure I have fashioned, within the everlasting order of my London churches. I look down, I see the rags in which I stand, a child again, begging on the threshold of eternity. In episode two of Hawksmoor, Philip Jackson played Nicholas Dyer and Nicholas Hawksmoor, with Norman Rodway as Sir Christopher Wren and Richard Johnson as Mirabilis. Miranda Foster played Anne, Ben Crow, Nat Elliott, and Thomas Arnold was Walter Pine and Walter Payne. Richenda Carey was Mrs. Best and Mrs. West. Andrew Winkert, Sir John Vanbrugh, and Terence Edmund, Hawksmoor's father. Helen Ayres was the pathologist, and Claire Corbett the archaeologist. The children were Jordan Calvert, Luke Smith and Bradley Souter. Hawksmoor was dramatised by Nick Fisher and based on the book by Peter Ackroyd. The director was Janet Whittaker.